I think you should be able to see my screen. Yes, it's all good. Works all right. Great. Okay, I just wasn't sure because I don't see any change on my screen or whatever, any sign of, of screen sharing, but I'm happy that it works fine. So thank you very much. Uh, as you will see, uh, yep, as Karin was saying, it will be that my talk will be on working memory and how it contributes to computational thinking, but not only to computational thinking, to coding, to programming, because indeed we are facing exactly the same challenges as uh, Irene has been uh, talking about. So that we, and also as uh, Jens in the, key, in the keynote before, that we are not it's not entirely clear what we mean on the computational thinking. It's not fully and well defined. And on the one hand, on the other hand, it seems the whole programming process seems to be composed of a number of different uh, parts, number of dif different bits and pieces. And we try to grasp certain aspects of it in every single work we are making. And yes, it might be, as Irene was saying, it might be that we are just taking, that some results are observed because we are taking a certain dependent variable. And in, in, especially in this case, um, and also in my case, that will be visible. So the overall, the central aim is to explore the contribution of working memory to programming, coding, computational thinking. I mean, I don't need to explain to any of you how important it is in the 21st century. Uh, children play around with their smartphones or their parents' smartphones in the beginning and then later on their own smartphones. And then, uh, I mean, they are indeed uh, some courses where kids are educated for programming, coding, or computational thinking, but uh, most of their knowledge in the beginning is picked up by themselves without any support, without any help. And uh, yes, there, there is a there are big individual differences on access to these, uh, on access to to tools, on ex access to apps, and uh, yeah, I mean it's not necessarily that kids are not accessing apps or not accessing the tools, but uh, they might not even know about certain tools. And that means that there will be huge individual differences by the time they reach the point where, for example, in Austria at year nine, they start being uh, educated in a uh, fixed computer science course. By then there are already huge differences and uh, yeah, a lot of knowledge had to be picked up by themselves anyway. Uh, why working memory? I mean, yes, we are talking about the cognitive foundations. So I think, sorry to interrupt you, I can only see the introductory screen. So there seems to be a oh. problem with the PowerPoint, which we should, okay. okay. And maybe if you start the presentation, because. Okay, I just, uh, maybe the problem is that I've got two screens and that's what uh, Zoom might not like, so I just... You need to hit the computer icon in the lower right corner. Uh, just one second, so... So yes, do you see the starting screen now? We yes. see the, the slides on the left-hand side. So can you start the presentation? Yeah, I've already started, but it seems okay. that... Okay. Uh, you you need to hit that, that computer monitor icon in the lower yeah, right. Yeah, I've corner. already hit. So I've already started my presentation. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me see if there is a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Sorry about that. So that it looks seems perfect. That <laughs> yeah, the PowerPoint presentation opened in a new window and I've already shared the presentation with a uh, PowerPoint window. Anyway, all right. sorry for all the All good, all good. Why working okay. memory? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so real the question is why working memory? We are talking about cognitive skills uh, and why we chose working memory is that working memory is a short-term memory system responsible for the storage and manipulation of information. So keeping different types of information in 
time and manipulating these representations in our heads. I mean, that seems to be, I mean, on a fen phenomenological level, seems to be very important for, for programming. So just keeping a certain trajectory, keeping a certain structure in mind, and until you implement, you have to keep all this information uh, in mind. When you are programming a variable, you have to define a certain variable, you have to provide a value to this variable, you have to track the changes that you make to this variable uh, or for a certain function. Uh, so these, this is a lot of information that has to be kept in mind, that has to be manipulated while stored in, in uh, our minds. So that's why we think uh, working memory would be interesting to uh, test how it predicts or, or contributes to programming, coding, and computational thinking. Uh, there has been, there is some empirical motivation as well. There are, there is some, there, there are some studies showing uh, the role of working memory in programming. For example, a study from 30 years ago by Shoot et al. Uh, they were testing how participants learn Pascal programming and working memory was the best indicator, uh, the best predictor for learning Pascal. I mean, it was 30 years ago, programming and computers were completely different. We've seen at the keynote that, uh, maybe we've seen Snap during the keynote that's completely different than what it was like to program in Pascal in 1991, I guess. Uh, so there has been a huge change in, in programming itself. Uh, so this is really a question whether it's still a kind of a uh, valid result. Uh, there was another study by Bergerson and Gustafsson from 2011, only 10 years ago, uh, and they were examining uh, professional programmers and they found that work, executive loaded working memory, so working memory where there was also a secondary task or something on top of the simple storage process uh, performance uh, with that uh, on those tasks were good predictors of, of uh, programmers, programming abilities, but these were professional programmers. Uh, so in these two cases, there was a, uh, a these two studies were focusing on uh, how working memory contributed to learning to program. On the other hand, there is this other study by Di Lieto uh, and colleagues from 2017, which was looking at the relationship the other way around. So basically they exposed participants to a robotic training, robotic course, and they've tested working memory before and after the robotics course. And they found that those who participated in this training, uh, they had a slight increase in working memory skills uh, compared to those who didn't participate in, a, in a, a training. So basically we are talking about a uh, reciprocal relationship. So the relationship between cognitive skills and programming and uh, are somewhere, so both affecting one another. Uh, I will show you three studies very, very briefly. Uh, you might have realized that it's very, very, so you might have found strange that I'm always talking about programming, coding, and computational thinking. There is a reason for that. I mean, first of all, because we are not completely sure how they are related to each other, but we are kind of completely sure that they are related to each other. Uh, but just that wouldn't motivate for using such a complicated uh, reference. Uh, why I'm using such a complicated reference is that I'm showing you three studies in which we were looking at different uh, aspects of these things. So in the first study, we were looking at primary and secondary school children who participated in an extracurricular programming workshop. In the second study, we were looking at primary school children. We were examining primary school children who tried to solve uh, a coding task. These were unselected participants, so they weren't those who were interested enough to go to an extracurricular summer workshop, but they were just recruited from uh, schools. And then in study three, we were look, we were testing, or we were, we were examining secondary school children with the computational thinking task that has already been to some extent introduced by Josef and. Uh, 
we were, I mean, the research question was the same in all three cases. How do working memory skills uh, support uh, programming, coding, and computational thinking? So let's start with the first study. This is uh, a, about the programming workshop. This was done together with Bernadette Spieler. Uh, the research question was that we tried to find out, uh, it, it was really a, a very first study that we were making. Uh, we tried to explore how, short, how certain cognitive abilities contribute to programming, and we used a short-term memory measure, uh, a measure for arithmetic abilities and creativity. So these were the three measures that we used, uh, and we tried to predict programming performance by chi uh, of children. These children participate in a pocket code uh, workshop. And this was an extracurricular workshop. So this was in summer. They were there. They were trained for four days. Uh, they were programming naive children. So they haven't learned any programming beforehand. Uh, they participated in this four days training. And then at the end, they had to create the, their own app. And the dependent variable was the anal uh, that we anal analyzed the app they created from certain perspectives. I will show you in a second what were these perspectives. And we tried to predict this, uh, the final app on the basis of three different cognitive variables. And we had 48 children uh, from prime, late primary and early secondary school. So the analysis of the final app, which was basically a dependent variable, it's based on uh, the MDA framework of uh, Unike and colleagues. Uh, and actually, with Bernadette, we have adapted this analysis for uh, pocket code programs, and that was described in this uh, paper. And basically, what happens here is that we are analyzing, we were analyzing three different, pers uh, the, the apps from three different perspectives. On the first hand, we were analyzing Oh, we were making statistics of the design elements. Design elements is really the outlook of the app, uh, about the shape and structure of the game. So are there title screens, intros, end screens? Uh, are there visual and sound resources used throughout the app? So it's really about the design, and it's really about the trajectory of, of the game, but just design-wise. Uh, the second... Uh, area of interest was were the game elements. Uh, we are talking about games, so kids were making their own apps, but these were usually games, and the question uh, these were only games. And the question was, what are these gaming things that are included? So what kind what what kind of a level of control we have? So what you can do in the app? Uh, what kind of movements can you use? What kind uh, what kind of controllers can you use throughout the game? Uh, do you get points? Are there some kind of countdowns or user feedback? So everything that is related to the game design, uh, these are included in game elements. Game complexity it was the third aspect, and that's pretty much a pure, aspect, pure descriptive aspect of programming. So this was just the number of functions, bricks, and code units uh, that kids have Made, that kids have uh, used when they were doing their own apps. So these were the three aspects of the final app. And yeah, we also had a fourth one, which was the total score of, the, of uh, these three. And then the, predictors, the three predictor variables were the short-term memory on the digits forward, uh, digit span forwards task. Uh, basically, children are getting a, num a sequence of numbers like nine to four, and all they have to do is that they have to remember and repeat the sequence in the same order. Length is increasing, so they get longer and longer and longer sequences, and uh, the short-term memory is characterized by the number of correctly repeated sequences. That's a typical measure of uh, short-term memory. Arithmetic skills was measured with a very typical measure of, uh, of arithmetic fluency. Children received a piece of paper on which there were a number of uh, single digit uh, additions, and they had to do the additions, as many additions as possible within two minutes. Uh, for creativity, 
we used, again, a very typical creativity task. Uh, it was the alternate uses task. Uh, children were asked, okay, just imagine there's a Frisbee. How could you use, what, what are the ways you could use this Frisbee as you know, a non-typical way? And then one example is, for example, we could use it as a plate. And there were five objects and each object could be, and kids had two minutes to provide as many alternate uses as possible within these two minutes. Uh, and that was uh, the creativity measure. So about the results, on the top right corner, you see the correlation matrix. Here you see the app uh, analysis aspects. So design elements, game elements, complexity, and the total score. Here we've got age and sh well, short-term memory, arithmetic skills, and creativity. What's interesting is that design elements was correlated with uh, short-term memory skills and arithmetic skills. Uh, game elements was correlated with creativity, complexity. So the number of uh, bricks, programming bricks, was only correlated with age and no other cognitive measures, while the total score was uh, correlated with age and arithmetic skills. What we did as in the next step is that we did a hierarchical linear regression analysis for all these four uh, dependent variables. In step one, we always entered age, and since we had a very low amount of a low number of participants in step two, we used the forward model. So we just wanted to see whether there was a significant contributor other than age. Uh, what we've seen is that in the case of design elements, short-term memory remained the only significant uh, variable explaining 70% of variance. In terms of game elements, uh, creativity explains 13% uh, of variance. In complexity, as expected, only age was a significant contributor. While in the case of total score, it was both age and arithmetic. Uh, skills, uh, both of them were uh, significant predictors. So uh, to interpret these results, I mean, the role of working memory is not completely surprising in design elements because this is really about how the game should look and what the, the trajectory of the game should be like. Uh, what is really surprising is that creativity has no, se seemed to have no effect here. On the other hand, creativity seemed to have an effect in game elements, which is basically, I mean, you might remember that game element is about uh, the use of controllers, the use of all the resources that are present. So it seems that in programming, creativity means that uh, we are able to use the technical possibilities that are around. So it's not just a free creativity, but it's really the creativity in terms of our own possibilities. Uh, we had a role of arithmetic in the total score, which is somewhat surprising. I mean, you have seen, uh, you all know pocket code, you have seen pocket code earlier in, in the introduction by Wolfgang, and, and this is a visual programming language, so there is not much room in for, for, for mathematical skills, so not much requirement for mathematical skills in uh, pocket code. So that's why it's kind of surprising that it seems that arithmetic skills are still relevant here, uh, which is interesting. And there is also one important result is that age seems to be a central factor. It's not surprising. We've got a big age range between 10 and 15. So that's not, I mean, it's not a wonder that uh, all the kids are seem to be able to learn programming better and make uh, better apps after a four-day training. So that was the first experiment in which children were participating in a programming course and we were trying to measure. I mean, it's the same problem as Irian was explaining that we were measuring programming performance only at the end and only by the complexity of the program uh, that they were making. So obviously it's not the uh, change not the not of the trajectory of programming, just the programming skills at the final point of the uh, workshop. 
we try to avoid this issue and we try to avoid another issue, which is that these children in experiment one, they were uh, participating in an extracurricular workshop. So they were already kind of motivated or at least their parents were motivated to the, uh, that the kids should be there. And that's not really good because these are only interested children. So in the next step, uh, we were looking at primary school children, an unselected group of primary school children. And we were trying to do something which can be done without training. And basically we did a coding course, a uh, coding task with them. So this was a master thesis of Ben Binder. And uh, in the case of coding, what we meant in coding is that there is a continuous event and children were asked to turn this, this continuous event into discrete steps and predefine these discrete, discrete steps in order to describe the continuous event at the end. So it's kind of a segmentation of the event and uh, a predefinition of the event. Again, we had working memory measures that uh, with which we tried to predict uh, this coding performance. And uh, we had 21 primary school children uh, from grades three and four, so a pretty narrow age range. Uh, the coding task itself is based on Eva's previous, Eva Marinus's previous uh, study. In this case, what we, what the kids had to do is that there was an Easter rabbit and the Easter rabbit had to go uh, through a certain pathway. The pathway was always set, so there were rocks around, so the, kids, the, the Easter rabbit could had to go in, in a single way and had to collect all the Easter eggs. When all the Easter eggs were uh, collected, then we had to provide an end mark. Uh, the route itself was varying between three to 12 steps and the target item. So the number of Easter eggs could be between one and three. And they were all together 21 items and uh, dependent variable was uh, the number of items solved. I mean, this task doesn't require any uh, previous knowledge of programming. I mean, it's really just, we are coding the route, we are coding the actions one after the other. Uh, there were three working memory tasks, the short-term uh, storage task, the digital span forward task is exactly the same as I was saying before. So there was a number, there were numbers and uh, kids had to repeat these numbers. And uh, then we had a task for short-term storm, short-term storage and manipulation at the same time, which was the digital span backwards task. It's very similar to the previous one kids are uh, provided an, a sequence of digits, so like 924, but they have to recall it in the reverse order. So when they hear 924, they have to recall it in, the, in uh, as 429. So it's not just storing it, but reversing uh, the sequence. And the third one was working memory updating, which was the MBAC task. This is what you see here on the right. It basically, it models how we are changing our focus and updating our focus of, of attention and updating the content of our working memory. Uh, so in the one back task, children have to, in, there, there are letters coming one after the other and children have to indicate when the current letter is exactly the same as the one before. So keep in mind and always at every single point, they have to refresh uh, what's being on, in focus. In the two-back task, it's exactly the same, except for two steps. So children have to remember and mark if, it's the, if the letter is the same as the letter two before. And uh, yeah, again, this is a very, very typical task. And the measure is the number of hits minus, minus the number of false alarms. That's, uh, again, a typical way to, uh, to use uh, the MBAC task. For the results, what we've seen, I mean, here we've got the core, here we've got correlations and uh, here we've got correlations with the coding task. So it wasn't correlated with digit span forward task, short, with short term memory, it wasn't correlated with and backwards task either, but it was correlated with working memory updating. Uh, you see the same thing here in a forward selection linear regression model. Uh, basically what we see here is that maybe it's not only about storage, 
uh, but it's rather about something more complex. So updating uh, measure, it seems to be a very important factor. And in the current case, it explained 20, over 23% of variance. So that was the second uh, experiment, which was really aimed at a uh, programming or training free thing. So something that uh, naive children can solve and uh, it has to be unselected. However, we never know whether our task is really valid enough to... Okay. <laughs> so very quickly, the last task uh, is that uh, we, in, in this case, we again looked at uh, an unselected group of children. Uh, they were uh, junior secondary high, uh, junior high school students, a uh, great number. We used the computational thinking test uh, Joseph was already talking about. So a Pac-Man has to reach the ghost and there are certain options. We had three uh, predictors, uh, digit span forward, digit span backwards task. And the third one was an executive loaded working memory task. The odd one asked task, uh, children have to have three, three, see three uh, objects and they have to point the odd one out. And then again, they three, see three and they have to point again the odd one out. And then they have to indicate where these were. So there is an executive load on working memory. Results, what we see here, uh, I mean, I only explained the regression. Uh, so we had enough participants to just enter all the variables at the same time. And we found that age was a crucial factor and uh, the odd one out task and the executive uh, loaded working memory task. So it's not about simple storage. It's not about uh, manipulation, but it's also about coping with a an, with an strong executive load. So to sum up, we've got three experiments, all three uh, examine the contribution of working memory to different aspects of programming, coding, and computational thinking. And in all cases, we found a uh, strong effect of, of working memory, especially when it comes to executive loaded working memory, and that's not counterintuitive at all. Uh, I mean, obviously what our problem is, is that these studies were very exploratory so we really started, I mean, they were kind of taking place at the same time and not one after the other. So obviously a better research program, <laughs> program is required, but these were really just exploratory studies. Uh, and it would be very important to define the relationship between programming, coding and computational thinking. And that would benefit, uh, and then we could benefit with uh, further research on this topic. So, Thanks very much and sorry for taking that long. Actually, you didn't. Thank you very much, Ferenc. You didn't take that, that long. There were some technical problems. Uh, I just want to make sure that people get their lunch break as well. Thank you I, very much. I just, if, if the others wonder, I just walked over to his office and, and showed him that he should watch the time. That's how you chair in an online session. <laughs> okay. Um, questions. We still have time for question and discussion. All clear or people want to have their lunch break? <laughs> Eva, please. Yes, Sal asked the question. So you, you're very interested in, in working memory and you show uh, all these correlations. But what would be if we talk about, um, well, there's distal measures and proximal measures, what would be the mechanism? So if someone is coding, programming, con uh, engaging in computational thinking, how is someone with a good working memory going to benefit from having this? So what your question is, what would be the phenomenological association between working memory? And, so that, that's what you refer to. 
Yeah, apparently you, you find this evidence that there's correlations. So apparently just like logical reasoning, working memory is important for programming or for coding or for computational thinking. But what is what is in the nature of these things that makes working memory so important? Yeah, uh, uh, that's, that, that's a very, very good question. I mean, really, I was just trying to grab this association on a phenomenological level. Uh, so, I mean, while programming, while designing these complex or carrying out these complex tasks, there are a certain number that there is a big amount of uh, information that has to be kept in mind and, and manipulated at the same time. So that's why I was trying to bring the, the example of variables. So whenever there is a variable included, then we have to uh, define the certain variable. We have to provide it an initial value. We have to alter the value of the variable. And at certain points, we always have to keep that in mind where these certain variables are at the, at the same time, whether they are in the domain in which we can access these variables. So if they are inside the function, then we might not be able to access them. So there is always a lot of information that has to be uh, kept in mind at the same time. And that's where I think there were, it's important that in experiment one, we found that uh, working memory or well actually in that case it was short-term memory was important from the perspective of uh, design elements so it was important for the for the setting of programs so how is what was the trajectory of the program is there a starting screen what's happening in between how do we get to the end so these are the things that we have to remember have to keep in mind all the time and that's just one example because in that case we were just talking about kids but but it applies to variables as well really on a higher level does it make sense this way <laughs> 